Welcome to Bedroom Forensics. Now, today is Friday the 13th, and on this day, the world knew that the Yorkshire Ripper was dead. Peter Sutcliffe murdered at least 13 women in the 1970s and 80s and attacked at least seven others. He was finally caught and jailed in 1981 before being moved to Broadmoor Hospital, where he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He was then thought to be stable enough in 2016 when he was transferred back to jail to HMP Frankland. Peter Sutcliffe was born in West Yorkshire in 1946, left school at 15 and began his killing spree 14 years later in 1975. Now I'm not going to go into the psychology of him as a killer, but I want to ask why did it take so long for Sutcliffe to be found and jailed? Well, firstly, let's go back to the 1970s and 80s. Computers weren't popular. Police forces didn't have the latest tech and everything was written on index cards and not filed in a way we do now. And there was no cross region referencing. If you were an officer who had your finger on the pulse across at least three counties, had an eidetic memory, then maybe you could see the attacks as serial killers were. But that's not really a likely scenario. So back then, police didn't link the murders. Now, these attacks took place across Leeds, Bradford, Manchester, Huddersfield and Halifax, a huge area, which meant the officers were thrown off the scent of a serial killer being to blame. There was, however, thousands upon thousands of statements collecting dust. There was thousands of statements being sent into all of these police forces and they were collated in one office but then some of them just sat on the side just collecting dust as officers were overwhelmed by paperwork. Now, Sir Lawrence Byford in his 1982 report after Sutcliffe was jailed said that the police handling of the investigation was dreadful. He said the ineffectiveness of the major incident room was a serious handicap to the Ripper investigation. While it should have been the effective nerve centre of the whole police operation, the backlog of unprocessed information resulted in the failure to connect vital pieces of related information. He went on to say that this serious fault in the central index system allowed Peter Sutcliffe to continually slip through the net. And slip through the net he did. And it wasn't actually until a pattern began to emerge with all the killings that they even thought it was the work of this one man. Victims were all struck over the head with a hammer before being stabbed or knifed with a screwdriver. Now, as time went on and more women were mutilated and killed, more evidence and more clues pointed to Peter Sutcliffe. However, human error came into play crucial similarities between Sutcliffe and the suspect given by those that survived were just dismissed. Like the fact he had a gap in his teeth, he had size seven feet, all of this vital evidence was overlooked. And one of the survivors was even ignored because she didn't fit the killer's victim profile. One occasion when Sutcliffe was interviewed by police officers, they showed him a picture of the Ripper's boot prints near a body and they failed to notice that Sutcliffe was wearing the exact same boots. And off he went to continue his spree. Another example was when a five pound note was found in the pocket of one of the victims and then traced to one of six companies, including Clark Transport, which employed Sutcliffe as a lorry driver. Police failed to connect the two uh, he was also interviewed, but was given an alibi by his wife and mother, which was just accepted. Police also overlooked Sutcliffe's arrest in 1969, before the murder started, for carrying a hammer in a red light district. And also by his friend Trevor Birdsell, who tried to point the finger at Sutcliffe, saying he was the killer in an anonymous letter. Peter Sutcliffe was interviewed by police nine times. His car was spotted 60 times in red light districts where the Ripper prowled for victim. And it was all there in that paperwork that was just ignored because it was just too much. West Yorkshire police were not prepared for the scale of this investigation. And this elusive serial killer continued to wield hammers, knives and screwdrivers across the north of England. 
But it wasn't just paperwork and human error and the huge scale of the operation, but there was also a hoaxer on the list. Wareside Jack, or John Humble as we'll get to know, sent hoax letters and an audio tape that convinced police that they should be looking for a man with a Sunderland accent, despite contradictory evidence from some of the Ripper survivors. In fact, it was Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield of West Yorkshire Police who was the one that was hoodwinked by Wearside Jack. He ignored warnings of hoax from voice experts and other detectives and kept pushing through. His mistake has been described as one of the biggest in British criminal history and it actually led to the deaths of three women by Peter Sutcliffe. It was awful, the waste of time. And John Humble, well, the hoaxer, he was eventually jailed for it. He never really explained his actions why. Apparently he did blame himself. Another important factor to note is that many dismissed the seriousness of these murders due to the women being prostitutes, which not all of them were, by the way. Now the attitudes back then, and unfortunately sometimes even now, was that these women asked for it. They put themselves at risks. They should know that they could get killed. It's really shocking to think that the misogyny in the force allowed women to be continually attacked and murdered and sometimes still happens today. Awful. Anyway, it was luck that got Sutcliffe in the end. Two policemen in Sheffield were walking past a Brown Rover in January 1981 and noticed that the car's registration plate didn't match the number on the tax disc. When they stopped the vehicle, Peter Sutcliffe was sitting inside and he was with a sex worker. Now he came to the officer's attention because he did fit the description of the Yorkshire Ripper that was put out by those that survived and he was then arrested. When he was arrested they looked into the car and found screwdrivers in the glove compartment. They went then back to the scene of his arrest and found a hammer and a knife that was 50 foot from where the car would have been. It seemed that Sutcliffe had dumped the weapons when the police officers allowed him to go to the toilet at the side of the building. Then while in custody, Sutcliffe suddenly and unexpectedly confessed and began a detailed confession lasting 24 hours. Now, following his eventual arrest and his jail, Sir Lawrence Byford did a hard hitting report that led to big changes in policing, notably the development of a computer system. And that allowed for much better collated information and eased cross-referencing across all forces. But this case will always remain notorious for the failures in the way it handled the investigation and the sad end to at least 13 women's lives and including the ones that survived. So let's take some time to remember those 13 known murder victims. Wilma McCann, Emily Jackson, Irene Richardson, Patricia Atkinson, Jane McDonald, Jean Jordan, Yvonne Pearson, Helen Ritka, Vera Millward, Josine Whittaker, Barbara Leach, Margaret Walls, Jacqueline Hill.